it's time for the Sunday morning service live from Family Worship Center at Jimmy Swagger Ministries in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We'll have music from the Family Worship Center singers and musicians and a powerful message from God's Word. Now we go back live to the Family Worship Center Sanctuary. This morning we serve a risen Savior. There's nothing impossible for him. You see, never has it been a problem bigger than my God can solve. Never has it been a question baffling the mind of God.
What a mighty God we serve. We want to welcome each and every one of you. I just want to say, first of all, happy Resurrection Sunday to each and every one. I'm so glad today that the stone has been rolled away and Jesus Christ is alive, victorious, seated by the right hand of the Father. Oh, hallelujah. He is alive. No matter what man say, he is alive. So happy Resurrection Sunday to each and every one of you. I want you to know that this coming Wednesday, which will be April the 15th, will be the 10th anniversary of Sun Life Broadcasting Network. Ten years ago today, we started this network, and we have seen it go all around the world, and we just want to thank the Lord, and we want to thank each and every one of you that have helped us, that are helping us each and every month to take the gospel around the world. And speaking of our celebration of our anniversary, share for April begins tomorrow, Monday, April the 13th, Tuesday the 14th, and then Thursday and Friday the 16th and the 17th. And we want each and every one of you to be in prayer about what the Lord wants you to do and be in prayer about uh, help to speak to other hearts and uh, that they may respond. And we just believe that you're going to reach, step up and help us and touch this world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to welcome this morning 71 brand new Family Worship Center Media Church members from Alabama, Angela A., Angela V., Claude, from Arizona, Betty, California, Alvin, Aaron, Bernadette, Geraldine, Florida, Bo, Giselia, Jane, John, Judy, Kenneth, Patrick, from Georgia, Becky, Judy, from Indiana, Faith, William, Iowa, Jackie, Priscilla, Stephen, Wanda, Kansas, Larry, Kentucky, Sherry, Louisiana, Bubba, Selena, Maine, Denise, Keith, Lathea, Marilyn, Patty, from Massachusetts, Mabel, Roberta, Michigan, David, Valerie, Mississippi, Randy, New Hampshire, me, New Jersey, Sandy, New York, Nia, Patricia, Ohio, Gwinnett, John, Scott, Shirley, Walter, Zachariah, Oregon, Deborah, Stephen, Pennsylvania, Iris, South Carolina, Linda, Mike, Tennessee, Justin, Pat, Texas, Mark, Martha, Nicole, Randy, Renata, Robert H., Robert P., Chantal, Virginia, Greg, Washington, David, Jessica, Clayne, Mike, Nancy, West Virginia, Kathy, Australia, Barbara, and then finally, the United Kingdom, James and Maud. We're so glad to have each and every one of you a part of the Family Worship Media Church family. And we're so glad that we're able this morning to bring you a live, a live resurrection service. This morning I was flipping the channel of all the different Christian networks and, and watching most of them were running reruns from last year's uh, uh, Resurrection Sunday. There were a couple that I saw that were doing live uh, streams, and but we're so glad to bring you a live Resurrection Sunday morning with anointed music, and anointed worship, and anointed preaching. We're here for you 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and I, I, I pray that you were able to see Friday night, uh, Gabriel and I, as we hosted the live two-hour special entitled Prayer for the Nations, and we received thousands of prayer requests from all over the world. We'll be praying. We prayed over them then. We'll be praying over them again in just a minute, and that program, if you missed it, it will rerun today 
at 12 noon. As soon as this service is over, it will start at 12 o'clock with prayer for the nations. And let it be a blessing to you. I think, I think that you will be a ble bless. Family Worship Center, Resurrection Singers.
and I want you to pick it up with your part one more time, but I want you to think about this for a moment, those that are watching and listening. With every major religion that is found in this world, not one, not one of those religions can boast of their founder rising from the dead. Not one of those religions can proclaim that their master is alive except for Christianity. We don't serve a dead Jesus. Our, our Jesus has risen. When you go to the tomb in Jerusalem, you will see a sign that says, He is not here. He is risen. One more time, Robin. Now suddenly the air was filled with strange and sweet perfume. With his arms held open wide And I fell down on my knees And I clung to him and cried He's alive, he's alive, he's alive He's alive and I'm forgiven I never did so alive again the stone is rolled away praise God we want to welcome each and every single one of you that are watching and listening to this special resurrection Sunday morning service I tell you it's a little it's a little weird not having resurrection camp meeting this week but we know all over the world we're all having camp meeting right now as dad mentioned on Friday night at 8 p.m. Central Standard Time we had a one-of-a-kind program on Sunlight Broadcasting Network entitled Prayer for the Nations. And we have, as you can see, as they're bringing the boxes here, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of requests, many of them dealing with sickness, with disease, with heartache, with care, with sorrow, with fear, lost loved ones. And, and, and of course, it's endless, to be honest with you. But we know we know that in spite of the need that we serve a risen Savior, that He's able to meet the needs of all of the individuals that are represented here and, of course, all those that are watching and listening around the world. Whatever the need is, if there is a need right now, you were not able to call it in or email it in, but there is a, a, a need, an issue that you're facing at this very moment. I want you to stretch forth your hands right now. and I'm going to ask Dad to come right now with me for a moment, and I'm going to ask him to lay his hands on these needs, and we're going to be praying for these needs right now. And I want you that are watching and listening, join together with us. Join together and believe God that he is able to perform a miracle for you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come before you right now, and we lift up every single need represented.
is in it here this morning. Lord, we, we ask that you would begin to touch every man, woman, boy, and girl, those that are sick in body. We rebuke sickness and disease in the name of Jesus. Those who have lost employment, we are believing that you're going to open a greater door in the name of Jesus. For those who have lost loved ones, we know that your arm is not too short to reach and to touch and to bring those lost family members in. Right now, we, we ask for miracles to perform, to be performed upon your people. We claim it right now. You are the mountain mover. And in the mighty name of Jesus, we claim every need. We claim every sickness, every heartache. We believe that you're going to move mountains. And we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Amen and amen. I want them just to sing a little chorus where the healing waters flow. And that's as we sing it, I want you, wherever you may be, just to stretch forth your hands and just receive that healing in the name of Jesus. Just sing that chorus where the healing waters flow. Wherever you may be, just reach out your hand right now this morning and begin to claim that need. In the name of Jesus, where there's peace, where there's peace, peace and rest, rest and love. And love. Come on, sing it one more time. Where those healing waters flow. In the name of Jesus, where there's joy, celestial flow. Just sing it one more time. Just one more time. Just worship him right now, saints of God. Just receive your touch right now. Receive your healing right now. Receive your blessing right now. In the name of Jesus. He's able to touch you right now. Wherever you may be, he's passing by at this very moment. He's able to touch you. with you right now that he's going to meet your need whatever it may be remember there's nothing nothing too hard for God to handle there is not one thing that is too difficult for God to handle he's able to meet your need he's still walking on the waters right now and he's still performing miracles amen we want to welcome you this morning once again to this service and we're so glad that you are tuning in wherever in the world you may be we want to welcome you to the platform of family worship center right here in baton rouge louisiana where we still preach that he is risen he is risen joseph come bless these people this morning
Joseph, I want you to sing that last verse one more time and take it out. I want you to listen. The devil has lied to some of you and said that the blood of Jesus Christ is not enough to save you and to set you free. I'm here to tell you, if you have accepted Jesus Christ, the blood has been applied to your heart. And he's still able to set you free and to make you free. The blood is still there. That second verse one more time, Joseph. He wondered why that young lamb had to die. Why his blood was on the door Through the wind and the rain It still remained But it wanted to be sure So he called out to his earthly father with a trembling voice so scared Crying, Father, would you please Look and see If the blood is still there And he Thank God for the blood of Jesus. It's still there today. We want to just thank each and every single one of you for everything that you have done and are doing to help to continue to take this gospel around the world. We know that we're in very difficult times, but we're asking that if you're able to do so, don't forget the work of God. You can see the number on the screen. You can go online and donate. Or those in the Baton Rouge area, you can always drop off your tithes and offerings to the office. And we thank you. We thank you so much for everything that you're doing. And we're just praying the richest blessings of the Lord upon each and every single one of you. Amazing. 
amazing grace will always be my song of praise. For it was grace all that bought my liberty. I do not know just why, oh, he ever, ever loved me so. He looked beyond my faults and so my His loving heart knew just where I had been. I cried aloud, and Jesus, when he heard my humble, humble, humble plea. He looked beyond all my faults and saw my need one more time now, one more time. My faults were great. I had one so far away in sin. But his loving heart knew just where I had been. I cried aloud, and Jesus heard. Well, he heard my humble, my humble plea. He looked beyond all my faults and 
so my knees I shall forever Lift my arms To Calvary <laughs> Yeah Hallelujah. He looked beyond my faults. Thank God he saw my needs. Praise the name of Jesus. Wherever you may be, just worship him right now. Just lift your hands and just begin to thank him and just begin to praise him. Just begin to worship him and thank him that he looked beyond our faults and he saw every single one of our needs. Lord, we thank you this morning. We praise you this morning. We magnify your name right now and thank you that you look beyond our faults and you saw our need. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Hallelujah. It won't take but just a moment. Could you sing that chorus just one more time? And I want you right now to thank him wherever you may be. Just lift your hands and worship him as they sing it. Please. Sing that chorus. I shall forever. I shall forever. Lift my eyes to the place called Calvary. To view the cross where Jesus died for. That grace that bought my fallen, fallen soul. He looked beyond all my faults and so my need. One more time now. I shout. Place called Calvary. 
Thank you, Jesus. He's still looking beyond our faults, and he sees our needs. Thank the Lord for that. Thank you, singers and musicians. Boy, I love that song. Great, great song. Great words to that song. Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 28. Matthew chapter 28. We're going to begin reading in the very first verse of this chapter. The last chapter of the Gospel of St. Matthew, Matthew 28, beginning in verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Now, I want you to listen to this. His countenance was like lightning and his raiment white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers or the guards did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the woman, do not fear. For I know that you seek Jesus, which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he goes before you into Galilee. There shall you see him. Lo, I have told you. And I want to use for a subject preaching a few moments here on this Resurrection Sunday. Run, Mary, run. Run, Mary, run. He's telling us right now to do the same. Run, Gabriel, run. And tell the world, he is risen. Run, Mary, run. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning in the name of Jesus. Lord, we just thank you for your presence that we have felt here this morning. We thank you that we can declare to the world that you are risen, that we serve a risen Savior. We ask for your anointing this morning. We cannot do without the anointing, the leading, and the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We ask that faith would be instilled in the hearts of your people, and we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen and amen. When you look back in history, from the very beginning of human history till the present time, you will be able to pinpoint certain events that were so spectacular or rather so devastating that it changed the course of humanity. You can look back at all of the wars, the Revolutionary War, World War I, World War II, 9-11, all of those events changed the course of history. You can even look back at some of the technological advances, radio, television, social media, the iPhone. These events also changed the course of the world. But of all of those 
miraculous, monumental occasions, there is still one major event that did more for human history and humanity than all of those events put together. And that is the birth, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Do you want to talk about life-altering events? This right here was the ultimate life-altering event. When you talk about events that can change the course of humanity, nothing else changes the course of humankind as the crucifixion. It is, the cross is the single most important part of the plan of God. Now, I want you to think about that. The cross, we're not speaking of a wooden beam. We're speaking rather of what Jesus Christ did. The event of Calvary, what took place on Golgotha, it was the most important and is the most important part of the entirety of the plan of God. The whole plan of God hinged upon this one moment. Even though that he was born of a virgin, even though that he performed miracles, he lived a perfect life. He spoke and blinded eyes were opened. Deaf ears were unstopped. Leprosies were healed. The dead even raised. But all of those things did not impact my salvation. It was the cross that changed my life. It was what he did on Calvary's cross that changed the life of untold millions, and you could possibly and even no doubt say billions around the world throughout time. Now, I want you to think about this, that the cross itself, when we say the cross once again, we're speaking of the event. There are three things that took place that I want to point out regarding the sacrifice of Christ and why it was so important. Number one, it satisfied the demands of the broken law. The law demanded a perfect obedience. It wasn't a suggestion. It was a requirement. It demanded a perfect obedience. But you see, there was nothing that man, nothing that he could perform, nothing that man can do that could regulate that perfect obedience to the law. And because of sin, man's very nature took on sin. It became a nature of sin. And because of that nature, because of the fall, because of what Adam did, it brought the entirety of the, of the human race down and enslaved them into a life of sin. And that was the legal hold that Satan had over humanity was sin. The law had been broken but in order to satisfy the demands of a broken law, there had to be a substitute. There had to be someone that could live a perfect life, that could obey the law in its completion, and to do for man what man could not do on his own. Jesus himself, he stated in the Gospels, I didn't come to do away with the law, I came to fulfill the law, in which he did in every respect. He became our substitute. He became the Lamb of God that Joseph sang about a moment ago who takes away the sin of the world. And because he satisfied the demands of a broken law, he became a curse for us, as Paul would say. Because of that, the second thing happened. He atoned for all sin, past, present, and future, for anyone that would just simply believe. Because he satisfied the demands of that broken law, he could now atone for all sin. 
And that way, whenever anyone says yes to Jesus, no matter how old they are, no matter how young they may be, no matter what statue they may have in life or what status they may have in life, the very moment they say yes to Jesus, all sins are gone. I remember, I know I've shared this a million times possibly, if that is of course, correct in speaking, of course, in exaggeration. We speak evangelistically right there. We're just exaggerating when I say that. But I've shared it any number of times. The day that I got saved, the night that I got saved, I was five years old sitting in my bedroom when my dad was coming to put me to bed. And for whatever reason, I was the only one there in the bedroom. My brother and I, I believe at that time, we still shared a room. And yet my brother was not there. He may have been over at my grandparents' house spending the night. But I'll never forget that night as my dad comes walking in and says, Son, it's time for you to go to bed. And I looked at him as only a five-year-old could do and say, No, I don't want to go to bed. I want you to preach me a sermon. Preach me a sermon like Papa. And for that moment, that space of five minutes, that short sermonette, Maybe dad looked at John 3, 16 and said, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And when he got to the end of that little sermonette, he said, Is there anybody in this building who wants to say yes to Jesus Christ? And me at a five, yeah, at that five-year-old little boy with tears running down my cheeks, I slipped up my hand, and he led me in the sinner's prayer. And even at that moment, as a five-year-old, I could say, gone at last, gone at last. My sins are gone at last. Yeah, I had a long streak of that bad, bad time, but my sins are gone at last. That's what we can all say. The very moment that you come to Jesus Christ, all sin, past, present, and future, was atoned for. And as a result of that, you got to think about this. If Jesus would have left one sin unatoned, just one, just one, if his blood would have covered 99.999% of all the sins that have ever been committed, and yet he left just point zero 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 one percent of those sins unatoned he'd still be in the tomb right now That's right. Yeah. did you get that he would still be in the tomb but because he satisfied the demands of the broken law because he atoned for all sin past present and future he was coming out of that grave. He was not staying in that tomb. He was coming out resurrected like anyone. No one has ever been before. And then there's a third thing that happened. He satisfied the demands of the broken law. Atoned for every sin, past, present, and future. And the third thing is that he led captivity captive. You see, every sainted dead from the time of Abel even to the very moment of that dying thief that we read about in the Gospels, who began cursing Jesus Christ, but in a moment's time said, we deserve what we're getting, but this man doesn't deserve this punishment. Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. From that moment and every person before who had ever lived, breathed, and died with the name of God on their hearts, they went down into this place called paradise. We can read about it in the Gospel of Luke. I believe it's in Luke 16 where Jesus gives a description of what hell is really like. And we know that from that description that paradise is in hell but not in the burning side of hell. There is a chasm, a great gulf between the two. You have hell on one side, the burning, the torment, the judgment, and then you have Abraham's bosom. But when he died on Calvary's cross, satisfying the demands of the broken law, atoning for all sin, past, present, and future, he was able to go down into paradise and lead captivity captive. He, he was able to lead every single one of them out from Abel to that dying thief and said, come on, ladies and gentlemen, we're not staying here one second longer. We are going to that place called heaven. 
And he held the keys of death, hell, and the grave in his hands. And no doubt, because of what he did, because of who he was and what he did, you have to understand the resurrection was never in doubt. It was going to happen. Now, I know that we even, even now, even though we've been on this, on television, in this regard, regarding the network for 10 years, even to this point, we still have people calling in, writing in, emailing in, and asking, and some are genuine. Some are not trying to start a fight. Some are, but many are genuine. And they ask us, and they write in, and they ask the question, you spend so much time dealing with the cross. How come you're not dealing as much with the resurrection? We have to explain it like this. The resurrection was never in doubt. He told his people, he told his disciples over and over and over again, they're going to kill me, but I'm going to rise again. I'm not staying in that tomb. Destroy this body in three days, and in three days I'm going to rise again. He proclaimed it. The resurrection was never in doubt, but rather the resurrection was the ratification of what Jesus Christ had accomplished. You see, before there could be a resurrection, there had to be a death. There had to be a sacrifice. There had to be a substitute. And Jesus Christ was and is that substitute. That he took our place so that you and I would not have to suffer the penalty of sin that if we just believe in Jesus Christ, who he is, and what he has done for us, then all sin can be washed away. And we can be made new, a new creation in Christ Jesus. But think about it this way. Paul would say in Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, that, and I'll paraphrase it by saying this, in the mind of God, when Jesus Christ died on Calvary's cross, you and I died with him. That in the mind of God, when Jesus was buried, we were buried with him. And that when Jesus rose from the dead in resurrection life, that we rose with him in newness of life. You can't have a resurrection without a crucifixion. The resurrection was never in doubt, it was going to happen. And this scenario that we're going to be dealing with here today takes place after the resurrection. It is stated that if you look at the Gospels, it is believed that Jesus, it is recorded in Scripture that Jesus met 12 times in his post-resurrection appearance to individuals, whether it was Mary Magdalene, whether it was the disciples, whether it was uh, Thomas, whether it was Peter and John, whomever it may be, it is recorded 12 occasions that Jesus would appear and meet with individuals or groups of people. And I want to focus on two of those events today. The first one, we want to deal with a woman whose name is Mary Magdalene. We really don't know much about who she is. We know where she was from. The city of Magdala was a wealthy city, but it was also a city of ill repute. It had a pretty negative reputation. It was a city of vice. And somehow, somewhere, some way, In this city was a woman who had been possessed by seven devils. I want you to think about that. The horror. A life that is complete insanity. Bound not just by one demon, but seven devils. I I, I can't imagine living a life 
without God, number one, but I can't imagine living a life bound by seven demon spirits. The facial features would change at a moment's time. Maybe possibly the vocal cords would change at a moment's time. A life of utter hell. But we don't know how and we don't know where, but somehow she came in contact with Jesus Christ. Somehow in her life she came to the one who could set her free and did set her free. And if I could just go back in time and just see that moment with my eyes to see how it happened, to see what happened and what took place. And if he spoke it, if he laid hands on her, all we know is that she became delivered from those seven demons, instantly delivered by the power of Almighty God. Tradition has her placed at the home of Simon the Pharisee where Jesus was eating. And her emotions became so overwhelming that her tears began to flood down her eyes and flood down her cheeks, and it literally bathed the feet of Jesus. And she would kneel down and wash his feet with her tears and with her hair. Speaking of a devotion, a love that is beyond comprehension. Can you imagine the very day that she was delivered from those seven demons? A countenance would be changed. Her life was changed. Her lifestyle was changed. The way she carried herself was changed. And as she would walk down the streets, her, a smile would be on her face, and someone who knew her would look and say, Mary, there's something different about you. There's been a change in your life. I don't understand it. You have to say, well, what has happened? And she can say as we sing that little chorus on Wednesday nights, oh, what a change. Oh, what a change. Oh, what a change in my life. I got Jesus on the inside, moving on the outside, bringing about a change in my life. You see, there is no change that can take place outside of a change in the heart of man as only Jesus Christ can do. That's why that we can all sing that chorus. And if there has been a change in your heart, you know this chorus very well. You're living this chorus. You've experienced this chorus. I've got Jesus on the inside, moving on the outside, bringing about a change in my life. Oh, what a change. Oh, what a change. Oh, what a change in my life. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what was going through her mind? Maybe some of you are watching and saying, you know, y'all sing that song over and over on Wednesday nights, and I'm tired of that song. You do it so many times. Well, I got another one that if you don't like that one, here's one that I know, no doubt, she was able to sing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. You see, you cannot get tired of hearing that song if you are a recipient of that grace. You'll never, ever get tired of hearing a song that speaks of, I've been washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb. You won't get tired of hearing songs like that because of the change that has taken place. But she was there when he was crucified. She was there when... He breathed his last. Her love and devotion, the one who gave her her life back, was now dead. Placed in a tomb. And the scripture says that before daylight, she becomes... She she gets closer to the tomb. She's carrying with her items to prepare the body for the embalmment process. 
her heart is shattered into a million pieces. She doesn't know really what happened or what's going on. And yet, as her head is down, no doubt tears running down her cheeks, she approaches the tomb and something catches her attention. Something that words cannot properly describe. She sees a stone that had been sealed, weighing upwards of 300 plus pounds, rolled away. And there is a figure that Matthew describes as he looks like lightning. Have you ever seen lightning? I know you have. You've seen pictures. You've seen videos of the electricity and the brightness of lightning, how it could penetrate a darkened sky and make it light up. This is what this man looked like, this angel from God who looked like lightning. A remarkable sight. One that beggars description. His clothing is pure white. And he is seated on top of that stone. And as she looks at him, and no doubt words were not able to come out because she's having a hard time processing what's going on. She sees the stone rolled away, and maybe fear grips her heart and thinking, what happened to his body? And yet, here's this angel that tells her, fear not. You see, this is one thing I want you to understand. Even in the midst of whatever crisis we are facing, the Scripture continually tells us, do not fear. Do not fear. Fear, don't be afraid, yet fear grips the heart of mankind in ways that really nothing else can. It causes us to do things that we don't really even consider doing. We wouldn't even think about doing, but fear at times drives us to engage in things, to try to fix the situation. And yet the angel says to Mary, don't fear. The one whom you are seeking, the one who was crucified, he is not here. He is risen. Can you imagine what was going through her mind? You can see it was utter disbelief. But yet I want you to think about this and I want you to highlight this in your Bible if you're following along with us, whether in your physical Bible or on a digital iPad or digital phone, whatever it may be, that digital version. I want you to underline this most crucial point because as the angel told Mary, he's not here, he is risen. He then adds, not only go and look for yourself, but go quickly and tell the disciples that he is risen. Go and tell the disciples. You got uh, you to understand this for a moment. He could have done this with Peter, James, and John, but he didn't. He allowed a woman to be the first one to herald and proclaim the resurrection news that he is not here. He is risen. I know that some people in some denominations think that women can't do much. Well, I'd like for you to talk to Mary Magdalene then. Because she was the very first one not only to witness the fact that he was raised from the dead, but the first one to proclaim the fact that he was risen from the dead. In other words, I would say that that angel probably looked at her and said, Mary, Mary, go tell the disciples that he is free and he's walking the streets of Galilee. He's walking those streets. Go and tell the disciples. Go and tell Peter. Go and tell John. Go and tell Thomas. Go and tell them all that he is risen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. She was the first one to proclaim that he is risen. Now, I'm going to fast forward about a week to another group, the 11. Now, I want you to notice that the Holy Spirit deemed it fit for Matthew to refer in this last chapter of Matthew, Matthew 28, 
he makes sure to refer to the disciples as the 11. He just didn't say the disciples, but he made sure to say the 11. Now, why was that? Everyone knows that Jesus selected 12 disciples. But Judas had abandoned the faith. And the Holy Spirit wants us to remember what Judas could have had and could have experienced. But he didn't. The sad thing about it, and I know my grandfather mentioned this a few Wednesdays ago, but the sad thing, if you really want to think about it, that for nearly 2,000 years, Judas has been in hell right now. Nearly 2,000 years burning, suffering, tormented day and night, and it will never, ever stop. That is a harrowing factor, a scary understanding. To know that the fires of hell will never be put out. And the Holy Spirit makes sure to elaborate that this is the 11. Now, no doubt there are others at this particular meeting point. The scripture says that they were meeting Jesus on a certain mountain. Whatever mountain that was, we do not know. But I want you to focus in on a certain place. You see, now... We have certain places where we can meet Jesus as well. In our prayer closet, in our prayer time, the study of the Word of God. These are those moments where we can meet and have that personal communication and relationship with Jesus Christ. And no doubt there are others there. It could have been the above 500 that Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians. We just don't know, but we know that others were present at this meeting place. And Jesus appears to the disciples, and the Scripture says that there were some skeptics. You know, there's always going to be skepticism when it comes to Jesus Christ, always. Even though there's been proof after proof after proof, there's always going to be skeptics. But the ones who know Jesus, they know their shepherd's voice. They know who their Savior is as the 11 saw him. You got to think about this. They knew it was him. There was something different about Jesus. Understand this. Dead people don't rise again. Well, what do you mean dead people don't rise again? You, you, you look in the scripture, you go all the way back to the Old Testament, and you can see where people risen, had been risen from the dead. Well, let me explain that. Yes, they had been risen from the dead, but I like to refer that as a defined resuscitation. Because even though they were resurrected, they came back to life. They came back in the same condition in which they were in, meaning flesh, blood, and bone. And eventually, every single one of them, from the young man that the prophet laid on, and brought him back to life to Lazarus, to Jairus' daughter, to, all, to, to the son whose, whose mother was a widow in Nain. Every one of them eventually died again. Every one of them. The little boy that was listening to the apostle Paul, who was seated in a window ledge, who had fallen asleep and fell several stories down to the floor below, died on impact, and Paul would go down to where that little boy was, and he would stop his teaching and go to where that little boy was and lay, that, lay down upon him, and instantly life came back into his body. But yet, when that boy got older, he eventually died. But there was a difference about this resurrection. This was unique because when Jesus came back, when Jesus was resurrected, he, was, he had flesh, he had bone, but there was no blood inside of him. The scripture says that all life is in the blood, but I honestly believe that when Jesus Christ died, he poured out the entirety of his blood for the entirety of the human race. He was void of blood, which means that his life system was different. What was it? It was the Holy Spirit that was living through him shining through him, emanating from him, flowing from him. 
Not only that, when he died and whenever he was resurrected, he's never going to die again. He will never die again. He died once and for all. As I like to say, it was a one and done event. It was one W-O-N, not O-N-E, but W-O-N. It was a one and done event. And they saw him. And the scripture says that they begin to worship him. That word worship means, means adoration. It means to fall down, prostrate. It means to kneel down in obedience. you got to think about what was happening at this moment. As these skeptics were watching this event, and the disciples, the eleven, literally would bow down. Some would kneel down. Some would probably lay down upon their face before him. See, worship is a lifestyle. Praise is what we do. Worship is who we are. Worship is something that when it's connected, when our spirit is connected to the Holy Spirit, when we worship Him in spirit and in truth. You want to talk about great things happening? Our whole life should be one of worship. Everything about our life should be one of constant worship because He demands it. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior. He is the Healer. He is the Deliverer. He is the soon coming King. And He deserves our worship. And Jesus would speak to them. And I love this. As they were worshiping Him and the skeptics, the doubters were out there watching, He would proclaim, All power under heaven and earth has been given unto to me. You want to talk about power? That word power means authority. It means jurisdiction. Everything under the kingdom of God, Jesus has authority. He has jurisdiction. He still works on the affairs of man without man compromising that free moral agency. He directs and guides the affairs of the church. He protects the church. He, he, he works with nature without going against the laws of nature. You want to think about power. You see, demon spirits have power. Satan has power. But their power is limited. Jesus is all-powerful. When he said all power, he meant all power. He is omnipotent. There's nothing that he cannot do. And this power gives him the ability to save, to heal, to deliver, to baptize with the Holy Spirit. He has all power. All power is in his hands. All power, not some, but all power is in his hands. I like to say it this way. You know, I... Everything can be said, mostly everything can be said in the words of a song. I'm not a singer, you know that. When people write in on the share thons and you know, the Bible thons and it's their birthday, they ask me all the time, Pastor Gabe, could you please sing me happy birthday? And my response has always been the best. I'm not a professional. I don't even sing in the shower, much less sing anywhere else. Because I want people to tune in, not turn off. So when people ask me, no, I don't sing, but I can tell you, I can recite the words of these songs and there, there's a song that we did many years ago and I'll just say it like when they got up to the mountain where they said they'd meet they worship and adored him and said Lord how can this be he said all power is within me from sea to shining sea now go tell all the world about me that I'll walk the streets of Galilee Glory to God. I tell you what, I need some help, ladies and gentlemen. There, there, you see, all of this right now, where it is coming to this point, to where we have been commanded to do the same as Mary was doing it, as the disciples did it. We need to do the same. Go tell all the world about him, that he is risen. Brian, can you just help me for just a moment here this morning?
command that the angel gave to Mary. Run, Mary, run. And the Lord same yes. command that Jesus gave his disciples is incumbent upon each and every single one of us. Time is of the essence. Time is running out, and we need to tell quickly that Jesus Christ is the Savior. He is the healer. He is the deliverer, and he is risen, and he's coming again. I want to just thank you so much for just tuning in today. We're going to just go out with a singer one more song with this song one more time. And I want you just to begin to shout, deliver, tell the world around you that he is risen. We love you. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in on this Resurrection Sunday service. One more time, Brian. Hope you were blessed and enjoyed this live service from Family Worship Center. Family Worship Center, located in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at Jimmy Swaggart Ministries, holds three services weekly, Sunday morning at 10 a.m., Sunday evening at 6 p.m., and Wednesday at 7 p.m., all Central Time. All services are broadcast live on the Sun Life Broadcasting Network, including Sun Life Radio, online worldwide at sunlifetv.com and on the free SBN Now app. To join the Family Worship Center Media Church, call 1-800-288-8350 or join at jsm.org. Live services are produced by the Sun Life Broadcasting Network. Many of you are interested in the history of this ministry, how my dad got started, where he came from. Well, dad has just put out a brand new autobiography entitled Amazing Grace. It's a story that every single 
viewer needs to read. I've had so many people comment that have gotten it, how enlightening it was and helped them to understand the true history of where we came from and the miracle working power of God to bring forth this great network. Well, you can have this particular book, Dad's Autobiography, entitled Amazing Grace, with a special price of just $20. It's normally priced at $30, but it's available for $20. You can call, you can write, or you can go online, www.sunlifetv.com. It's safe and it's secure. And I guarantee that when you receive this book, Amazing Grace, you're not going to stop reading until you're through. So order it today.